Hi, I'm Coy Barefoot. Coming up, my exclusive extended conversation with Terry McAuliffe, the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Governor, welcome to the program. I'm glad you're here. Hey, great, Coy. Happy New Year. Let me start by asking you about your legislative proposals for the General Assembly session of 2016. Can you take a moment and put the spotlight on one or two items in that package that, from where you sit, Virginians really need to take notice of? Yeah. Let me take three, if I could, very quickly. Number one, education. Uh, I put a billion dollars of new funding in for education largest finance we've ever had before for education. Historically, you know, we have cut during tough times, we've cut education. Since 2008, we saw about 5,000 positions cut in the classrooms and support personnel. I'm putting 2,500 instructional staff back into our K through 12. Absolutely critical for what we need to do to build the new Virginia economy. I'm putting money, $50 million for at-risk children to help uh, folks who most need help. We're revolutionizing high school here in Virginia. I want to lead the way to transform it. Big buildings, classroom with seats, were built on the Industrial Revolution. We got to end that. You talk about a new 21st century economy, 21st century cybersecurity, data analytics. We got to reshape our high school. We got to get our students excited earlier. And then in high school, let them go out and work on the field a little bit, get credit for that. So total revamp on how we do. Uh, education. We've gotten rid of five SOLs. I've called for shortening the tests. We have third graders taking six-hour tests. I want to see it where our tests are no longer than two hours. We're now doing some computer adaptive testing which can really formulate what is the student learning, what do we need to focus on, and that's where we need to go. Second big issue, veterans. 800,000 veterans in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Tremendous honor, but tremendous responsibility with that. So we invest a lot in our veterans program best workforce you could have. Dedicated, highly motivated, highly disciplined. We want the veterans to stay here when they come out of active duty. And the third big area which encompasses all of it is continued investment in economic development. We are not going to cover off the ball right now in economic development. 4.2 percent unemployment rate, lowest any state in the southeast United States of America. 3,848,000 Virginians working right now, more than any other time in our history. We've done uh, about 565 economic development projects, 9.3 billion in new capital. We have shattered every record on economic development. We're just getting warmed up. But continued investment, smart investments, building that 21st uh, century economy is what this budget is all about. Every page in this budget, Coy, is to help figure out how do we move Virginia to the next level. You made some news recently regarding proposed changes to Virginia's juvenile justice system. Yeah. Explain that to us and why that has attracted your interest and, and your staff's interest. Number one, it's a total failure, the system that exists today. You know, I come from a business background. I've started dozens of companies. I'm trying to bring an entrepreneurial spirit to our government. Right now, we spend on average about $186,000 for someone who is in one of our juvenile detention facilities, about a year and a half. 80% coy of the folks who move out of the system are back and rearrested within three years. So explain to me that's a good investment of our money. So I've just visited Beaumont and Bonaire, which are our two big juvenile justice facilities. I believe I'm the first governor to visit, and clearly the first governor to vis ever visit both of them. They're big, concrete, they look like penitentiaries. What I'm trying to do is move to a model, smaller, more community-based, First of all, they're about 550 bed capacity. We only have 350 folks in our juvenile correction facility today. So we have way more capacity than we need. By doing this, in these two new smaller centers, families will be able to visit, which I think is important, that families can go visit uh, their loved ones who are presently in one of our juvenile facilities. And second, we can save our budget about $19 million a year. That would be the saving by shutting down these gigantic old concrete structures and building these smaller facilities. Now, five years, guess what? We have totally paid for what we're proposing to do. It costs $93 million 
to, to close and to build these new ones. So it's cost savings, but more importantly, we're gonna do community programs in our new facilities. So when these juvenile uh, folks get out of these juvenile centers, they have some skill set. So the COI, they can go into the workforce, get back into school. They become productive citizens so that 80% are not rearrested. It is a horrible cycle we have today. It is a waste of taxpayer money. We are not helping these young folks. As I tour these facilities, you're talking 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds. Yeah, they made a mistake, but you know what? They've got a huge potential, and that's what we should focus on, because over the long run, by doing that, we'll save the Commonwealth taxpayer money. Let's talk about guns mm -hmm. and your proposals. Yeah. We have arguably uh, an epic and historic public health crisis mm -hmm. in, in the gun issue that has been deadlocked and it's up against a brick wall ideologically. An ideological debate. Ba debate has essentially crushed much of the conversation that we should be having yeah. about public health and guns. Yeah. What's Virginia's role in that national conversation and what's our responsibility in showing a way forward for the nation? It's a good question. Where Virginia fits, unfortunately, uh, we fit at the top and why we have a national role. And unfortunately, the reason is, number one, a Virginia Tech massacre was the worst massacre on campus in the history of the United States of America. Number two, last year we had two journalists were assassinated live on national television. So Virginia is at the forefront. And people have tried to politicize the issue. Let me be clear from my perspective. When I ran for governor, Coy, I talked about this issue every day. This is not a new issue to me. Nobody in Virginia should be surprised when I talk every day about wanting background checks. I talked about in the campaign, and nearly a million one folks voted for me. So there should be no illusions. I believe in background checks. Now, I'm a gun owner. I own three guns. I hunt. I like to take my two boys hunting. I went through a background check. All I'm asking is common sense. There are individuals today in Virginia who should not be able to purchase a firearm. Criminals, domestic abusers, those with mental illness. You don't know if there's not a background check. We have gun shows. We just had one up uh, by Dulles Airport. Thousands of people showed up. There are booths with signs that say, come to our booth, there's no background checks. Who do you think is going to that booth? A law-abiding citizen, now let's talk about the Second Amendment. We are not stopping anyone from buying a gun. We are not taking a gun away from anyone. The only thing that is happening, those in society, criminals, mentally ill, and so forth, should not have a gun. But if you're a law-abiding citizen, I don't even know what you're squawking about. No one's trying to take your gun away. No one's trying to prevent you from purchasing it. So you hit it right on the head. It is political ideology. Unfortunately, too many politicians are bought and paid for by the NRA, and they are scared to take them on. I got elected to get things done. I think most people in Virginia will say, we always know where the governor's coming from. I don't hide the ball. This is an issue that has been something I've been impassioned about for many years. It's common sense. I'm trying to be a problem solver. Let's keep the politics out of it. But all I'm trying to say is go through a two or three minute background check. I just took my son the other day. He and I went to watch some football, stopped at a bar. He's a Marine, but he had to put his license out, you know, Coy, in order to buy a beer. He doesn't have to put his license out to buy a firearm. I just don't get that. It's simple. It takes two to three minutes and it's the right thing to do. We've had too many tragedies. We stopped last year uh, at gun shows where there were background checks, about 260, 70 people were stopped. Guess how many people weren't stopped? Ask any crowd you're in, Coy, put your hand up if you think a criminal should be able to buy a firearm. I'd like to know who puts their hand up in that crowd. What are the early indications you're getting from the General Assembly, from the <laughs> Republicans good. on this issue? Not okay. good. It's, it's, um, and people say, why do you even propose a bill again if it's not going to pass? Uh, you know, you're not always successful in life, but you better keep trying. You can't win on the playing field if you're not suited up and on the field. So I'll continue to talk about it. I'm hoping I'll pass it. But if I don't, I'm laying one more predicate down for my successor and others that this, at some point this is going to happen. The, the Pew Research came out and showed that 85%, 80 to 85% of Americans support background checks. 
<laughs> Coy, do you know how hard it is to get 85% of Americans to agree on anything? But there's support. This is common sense. Your friendship with the Clintons is well established, well known. Yep. You've already been out on the campaign trail. Yep. Yep. Um, speaking out in support of Hillary Clinton. Yep. I'm interested in your perspective of Virginia in the race for the presidency now that we are arguably one of those purple states yeah. and Virginia isn't the, the lock that it used to be. Right. Uh, these candidates really have to get on the ground in Virginia and make their case to voters. Yeah. What's your role in that and what's the place of Virginia in that race for the White House now? Well, it, it, let me start with your the, the first point that you mentioned, I do support her. You know, I've been, I've had a friendship with Hillary Clinton for 30 years. Uh, both she and the president have been great to Dorothy and I. We vacationed together. You know, they've been right with us in the raising of our five children. So I know, to me, it's personal. That's why I went to New Hampshire and I went to Iowa. I think it's important to hear from people who know folks personally, not just through a television ad or a leaflet. I know them personally. I know both of them very, very well. I speak to them frequently. Uh, I think she will be a very strong, very dynamic president. She is strong. She is tough. I know her soul. I know her passions. I know the things she's interested in. I mean, this is a woman who graduated from Yale Law School, could have worked for any firm in America and made a lot of money. She walked away from that. She went to work for the Children's Legal Defense Fund. When she was First Lady of Arkansas, the fight that she had for children. When she was First Lady of the United States, Coy, she led that fight to make sure people had quality health care. And it was not an easy battle, but you know what I love? They keep trying to knock her down. She keeps springing back up. You know, I always respect people who stand for what they believe in, get beaten up, but you know what? They get up the next day, dust themselves off, and get back in the arena. She, I think, is important. We have probably three Supreme Court justices that will be up for the next president. Winning this, I think, is very important for those of us who believe in those issues of health care and economic equality for everyone. This is what she's going to fight for. She can win the general. I think it's very important. We need to win the general election. She can do it. Um, I feel, you know, uh, you know, I'm just blessed to say I've known her for so many years. But this is a very important election for us, primarily, as I say, because the three Supreme Court uh, justices right now, as you know, uh, probably will retire in the next couple of years. Three justices can change any vote in the court. This is an important election. How does she win in Virginia? I think today she wins in Virginia. Um, the competition at that point will probably be, you know, uh, Hillary and Bernie. And uh, I think uh, her message is a message that she gets things done. She's fought on these issues forever. This is, she's not new to these issues. And that she can win the general election. And the issues that I fight about every day here in Virginia, growing the economy, diversifying the economy, providing health care, protecting taxpayer dollars, these are the same things she's going to talk about. So I feel very confident, A, she's going to win March 1 as our primary, but then most importantly, the general election. But you're right, it is a purple state. We have to get turnout up. People show up when they get energized on issues. And she is very succinct on these issues. She's laid a very uh, aggressive plan out on her platform. You know exactly where she is on those issues. And I think as people begin to focus, the more and more closer we get to the general election, uh, I think her message will resonate. Governor, we're going to take a very quick break. Okay. When we get back, I want to ask you about Cuba. You're watching the Koi Barefoot program, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Governor McAuliffe, you were recently in Cuba. What, 
what's the takeaway from this emerging new relationship that Virginia and America has with, with Cuba? Why is Cuba important? There are 11 million people who live 90 miles off our coast. Today, Cuba is trading with every country in the world. Canada is down there building resorts. Germans are there. The Chinese are doing offshore drilling there. Everybody's there but us. It doesn't make any sense. This is a huge opportunity. Virginia has already sold $400 million of ag products. We can take that up exponentially when we have full trading relationships. So it's, to me, it's a huge opportunity for us. Why do I travel so much? You know, I'm probably, if not the, in the top two or three most traveled governors in America. Why? 95% of the world's customers, Koi, live outside the United States of America. I'm going where the customers are. That's how you build market share. That's how you diversify your economy. Um, in 2014, the last, we don't have our numbers for 15 yet, $36 billion of trade. That's the future. That's how you grow an economy. And that's why I travel so much to open up these markets. We have the deepest port on the East Coast. We're the only port on the East Coast that can handle the post-Panamax ships, which will come through the Panama Canal this year. When they come to these gigantic 10, 12,000 TEUs, where are they going? Right now, they're just coming to Virginia. But New York, New Jersey are raising the Bayonne Bridge and Miami's dynamiting going down. We have a lead. Let's drive that market share while we have this opportunity and lock in these customers. I know in my conversations with some folks down at the port that one of the challenges is not getting the ships in, but then what do you do when you offload all that stuff? How do we get this stuff yeah. to the inland ports, uh, rail, yeah. the, uh, a, a third crossing? You know, what can we do to address that bottleneck down at the port that yeah. is inevitable? The first thing we had to fix when I became governor is there were a lot of problems in our port. It had lost money for years and years. I'm proud to say we have now turned it around. We have a new board. We have a new executive director doing a dynamite job. Last year, Coy, we made money. About $13.5 million, which was a $30 million turnaround from the year before. We're profitable. Now, we ne now need to take it to the next level. Now that we got the efficiencies in, it's being run like a business, and we got good management practices in place. But how do we now, as you say, once it gets there, how do we build it so we can get the goods out to the breadbasket of America and all the, the commerce that we needed to get to. We need to invest in our rail infrastructure. We need to fix our roads. We need to do this. We have an advantage now, as I say, because of our deep port, but we cannot let up. We have got to keep our foot on the gas uh, to make sure that we're really building and diversifying that port. And so I've put $350 million in the budget. We've put a lot of time and a lot of emphasis on infrastructure. Uh, I'm adding lanes, as you know, to 64. I just did a big new interchange at 564 down there, which is specifically for the port. So we're opening up. I'm spending money. We're doing it smartly. You know, I had to fix some bad transportation projects. I had to cancel, uh, you know, Route 460. They had spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a proposed road that not a shovel had gone into the ground and not a permit had been applied for. You know, we're going over hundreds of acres of wetlands. They didn't even apply for a permit. So we stopped that. That's not going to happen anymore. You know, my job is to protect your taxpayer dollars, so we stopped that. You know, horrible deal, the Midtown Tunnel deal, I had to restructure that deal. So we're making tremendous progress, but we're, I want ever, all the folks to know we're spending your taxpayer money very prudently, very wisely, and stretching it to get our biggest bang for the buck. Governor, let me take a moment to ask you about the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. Over the last couple of decades, we've seen a, a, a real erosion in the state support for the university for higher education in general. Yep. UVA is getting ready over the next few years to celebrate its 200th yeah. anniversary. Um, work started construction in 1817, received the state charter in 1819, classes opened in 1825. It's about a 10 year window to celebrate this bicentennial and there'll be lots of celebrations. Lots of fundraising opportunities. It is indeed. <laughs> what do you say to UVA? What do you say to the alumni? What do you say to the people who love the university is the writing on the wall, what, what's the play for the 21st century yeah. for UVA? Well, the play they'll take out of the budget, which I just presented, Coy. As I say, for years and years, we've gone down in our spending. I'm trying to make our colleges and universities incubators for innovation, trying to drive the data analytics, the cybersecurity, the personalized human genome sequencing, all the proteomics, the new medicines, which UVA fits into. That's nice talk, but I'm actually putting money behind it 
That's why I just did a $2.4 billion bond offering, which our colleges and universities are about $800 million of, and our community colleges are about $200 million of for research and development. So we are building a big new research facility for UVA. We're doing the same thing at Virginia Tech. So I think what you've seen in my budget is a re-emphasis on helping our universities become global leaders in the areas that we need the technology. We need to do a better job, Coy, of commercializing all of the great ideas that are coming out of our universities. I've told our universities and, and all the presidents when we meet, you all need to do a better job also of collaboration. There were too many silos in Virginia. They weren't working with each other. You can't do it alone. So we're really promoting having our colleges, universities, UVA and Virginia Tech and George Mason collaborating on some of this new 21st century. And, and listen, I think we're making tremendous progress. I mean, we're moving in the right direction, but it isn't just talk. I've actually done the bond offering, which directly will help UVA move to the forefront because you look at what they have there, the tremendous ability at UVA with all the medical research that they're doing, what I talk about genome sequencing and all the work that we're all doing uh, to make us the, what I call the brain state studies on the brain. We can do that. UVA can be a global leader on that. But we've put up money to help them do what they need to do to build the facilities. And when you build the state-of-the-art facilities, you can recruit state-of-the-art researchers and scientists that will come in and work in these new state-of-the-art facilities. Governor, Virginia is arguably one of the most gerrymandered states in this nation, yeah. where politicians continue to select their voters instead of the other way around. Yeah. What's the way forward on this? Yeah. How do we get out of this? How do we create truly competitive districts where we can actually see a, an open market of ideas competing in our government? You've hit it right in the head. This is something I talk about uh, a lot. I think this has done more damage to democracy in our nation than anything else. These gerrymandered districts where folks don't have to run a general election. If they win their primary, they're guaranteed of winning. Just look here. We just had our whole General Assembly up, Coy. 140 members of the General Assembly, 100 House of Delegate members, 40 state senators. Out of 140, Coy, 79 did not even have an opponent. Now think about that. I think competition is good. And why you can't get an opponent is because you can't beat the candidate, you can't beat the incumbent. Same thing in Congress, 90% of members of Congress guaranteed win in re-election. So people, you got someone who's running a business, who's an entrepreneur, you probably want that person to run for office and bring those entrepreneurial ideas to government. They're not going to do it. If you can't win, I'm not leaving my business to go do that. So I think it really tamps down the creativity, the juices that we need to take our government to the next level. And it's very unfortunate. Um, and it's not only Virginia, but it's all over the country. Certain states have shown leadership, like California. I'm for an independent, nonpartisan commission to draw lines. I've said that publicly, but it is very hard to get any institution to vote to change the, the, the lines that could cost that person their seat. That's the unfortunate thing. So maybe we move to a referendum, but here in order to do that, you know, we have to have the chamber pass it, then it goes to referendum and the succeeding chamber. It's very difficult to do that here in Virginia. But the answer is independent, nonpartisan. All I would like to see as governor is competition. Lines that are fairly drawn so that they're not these crazy long with squiggly lines and tails, but geographically that are competitive as close as you can get to 50-50. That's good. That's good for democracy. And we are so far away from that. The problem I have today, and let's cut right to the chase, on Medicaid expansion. I have now come up with a plan where the hospitals will pay any cost differential from the federal government. So the state of Virginia has no financial obligation, no short term, no long term. So we in Virginia could bring $2.4 billion back. And that was always the crux of the uh, opposition. That, that was plan. the latest like, argument. We're going to get caught so with the bill. Something. Yeah. So now we've answered that. No obligation, zero. 2.4 you can billion you can bring back. This is your money, Coy. You get it back. You provide health care for 400,000. You can create 30,000 new jobs. We have 17 of our 27 rural hospitals today in the red. Someone close. I can fix all that with no financial obligation. But the general, as soon as I make a proposal, they say we're not going to do it. I'm not going to vote for it. The problem is, is they can't lose a general election 
They can only lose in a Tea Party primary. And that has so chilled folks that they're not willing to take that chance and do what I believe is in the right interest of their constituents. Sad. Take a moment just to wrap up here. Yes, sir. To talk to the disillusioned Virginia voter yeah. who believes in his or her heart. It doesn't matter who I vote for anymore. Gerrymandering, regulatory capture, money in politics, yeah. rent-seeking economics, a democracy that has become a plutocracy. As the governor of Virginia, what gives you hope? And share that hope yeah. with the disillusioned American citizen. Well, let me first of all, here in Virginia, tell you, elections do matter. You know, I ran a very aggressive uh, campaign for governor. I took stands that most people do not take running statewide uh, on the Democratic side or on the Republican side for, for governor. But here we are two years later. They want to shut the 18 women's health clinics down. As you know, they changed the regulations so that women's clinics had to comply with hospital regulations. The goal of that COI was to shut them all down. They had to widen hallways, add water fountains, parking. We, we knew what the deal was. They couldn't afford to do it. They were shut down. New Board of Health changed all those regulations. No longer is, is that what has to happen here in Virginia. So guess what? Our women's clinic stayed open. I talk about being open and welcoming to everybody. I'm proud I was one of the first statewide candidates in the South to come out for marriage equality. First thing I did, executive order. No discrimination in the state workforce for anyone. No matter whom you love, no matter what your religion. And look at Virginia Day. I was the first Southern governor to perform a gay marriage. The point I'm trying to make is we are open and welcoming. You want to come to Virginia to start a business? We want you here. So I'm telling you, elections do matter. I've done executive order number 50 to keep our communities safe. I've banned guns from our state office buildings. I can tell you, elections matter. If I were not sitting here today, we would not have repealed those women's health clinic regulations. We would not have moved aggressively to make Virginia open and welcoming to everyone. And I can go down chapter, line, and verse. So I can tell you, on the executive side, elections matter. But you got to have a governor willing to step up and listen, I'll fight for what I believe in. And I'm going to fight as hard as I possibly can for the things I, I believe in. You don't always win, but I'll tell you this, I'm always in the arena. That's why behind my desk, I got that Teddy Roosevelt quote. That poor timid soul knows neither victory nor defeat. <laughs> That's not me. And uh, to those that are disillusioned, I understand it. Elections when 79 out of 140 don't have competition, I get it. They don't see things happening. But there are things you can do at the executive level where things do happen. But don't be disillusioned. Don't walk away. We are the greatest nation on earth. We are the greatest democracy. Yeah, we got issues. But you know what? That's how you change it, by getting engaged. And working together over time may not be immediate, but, you know, step by step, brick by brick, you can build that wall. And uh, what I've tried to do here is knock down walls of intolerance. I want Virginia to be open and welcome. I want to focus on growing the economy. We've had tremendous success building the new Virginia economy. As I say, you know, you look at the capital investment we've had, more workers today. You know, our initial unemployment claims I just announced the other day, Coy, were the lowest level in 41 years. That's all good news. We've been able to do it by making this the best place to raise a family, the best place to start a business, best place to educate your children. And we're trying to make sure you can drive on our roads without being stuck in traffic too long. That's what we're focused on. And that's why, please don't be disillusioned. Stay in the game. Yeah, we have issues, but we can fix them if we're working together. Governor, thank you for your time and for thank your you. service to Virginia. Great. Thanks Glad you could be here. You've been watching the Koi Barefoot program. Have a terrific week and you all be good to each other.